Good evening. I am delighted on behalf of the centre. Oh, but by the way, we're going to change the name of the centre. It's far too long to keep repeating. Uh, so if you've got any good ideas about new names for centres, please let me know. Uh, uh, but on behalf of this centre, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you. Uh, and importantly, to welcome Major General Stuart Skeets. Um, it was interesting when we were, when we were in, the, uh, in the station to, to, to welcome him. We were, we, were, we were trying to work out, now how would we know who he is? But there was a certain charisma there. So those of you who are into charismatic leadership theory, this is the man to go to. Uh, the, uh, Stuart will give the second of our annual Armed Forces Lectures. We invited him not just because he knows a thing or two about leadership and its development, because we also want to facilitate dialogue between different sectors about the nature and practice of leadership. Note that this is dialogue not dialectic. This is the one, no, but you, you'll be full of intellectual points, but, but the, the, for, from us, this is the one intellectual point we will make tonight. Uh, now, the distinction between dialogue and dialectic. Dialectic is about an argument or debate about the truth of a proposition. It is endless. Okay? Well, dialogue is much more exploratory, and it focuses on relationships, meaning, and identity. And that's about doing things together, and about learning from each other. Uh, theory, values, and practice come together, and we learn as much about ourselves in the dialogue as we learn about the other. Uh, that's what we want with these, with these lectures, uh, that kind of sharing. Well, there's a lot to learn about Stuart Skeets. Following Staff College, he was Deputy Chief of Staff to the newly formed 16th Air Assault Brigade, as, and then returned to the 7th Parachute Regiment Royal Horse Artillery as the battery commander of one parachute battery. He was posted on promotion to Northern Ireland as the military assistant to the general officer commanding, and then commanded 26th Regiment Royal Artillery in Gotteschloh, Germany. He then served as the deputy commander of the 52nd Brigade as Task Force Helmand, <coughs> as deputy assistant chief of staff J3 operations in the permanent joint headquarters, interspersed with the higher command and staff course. He then commanded the 19th Light Brigade in Northern Ireland, followed by 18 months of the U.S. <coughs> Marine Corps as the Deputy Commanding General of 1st Marine Expeditionary Force Forward in California and Afghanistan. He has been Commandant of the Royal Military Academy Sanders since August 2013. He's actually moving on. These generals have never stay still too long in any particular way. But we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, he served on operations in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Iraq, <coughs> Afghanistan, the Balkans, Cyprus and Northern Ireland. He holds a BA Honours Degree in History, King's College, London, uh, and two Master's Degrees in Defence Administration, Cranfield University and in Defence Studies, again King's London. He's Honorary Colonel of the 103rd Regiment Royal Artillery Volunteers and President of the Royal Artillery Orienteering. From that list... We know that we don't, that we will learn more about him, but that we will learn a good deal from him tonight. Before we hear that, Peter Nelson will tell us something about the faculty and the context of this. Thanks. Well, good evening, and the second welcome. It's rare that you get a double act introduction, but a very brief one tonight uh, to welcome the general here and thank you for coming. Um, as a university and as a faculty, we are adopting a, a practice-based approach to what we teach our young business graduates. It is a very difficult thing to do to take theory on the one hand and combine it with practical experience successfully and transform an individual into a leader. We know that there's an awful lot written about leadership in our management texts, but very few organizations out there are good at combining the two. Um, Many years ago, long, about 10 years before you thought about becoming a, uh, an officer cadet, I had my little brown John Adair manual, of, what was it, the Handbook of Leadership, I think it was called, and had to run a course on leadership uh, in the New Zealand Army. And I remember thinking then, how on earth do you take this theory and apply what we're doing out there? Well, there is one organization that's managed to crack that successfully, decade after decade, and is the archetypal symbol of 
how to develop leadership, not just in the military, but once you've got it, it stays with you. And I, I thought, while I was thinking about this, there was an article in the press last week that the geneticists have now come up uh, with an understanding that our life experiences actually change our DNA. They've managed to identify this on the end of some genetic code that our experience in life can change us radically. And we, we all know from experience that that takes place. And I started musing on uh, warrior races like the Spartans and how they, they had an interesting selection process for their young people. So, um, you know, if you survived it, then I believe the leadership training was quite effective in its day. Um, we're much better at it than, uh, these days, but certainly Sandhurst is the epitome of, in my view, the best in the world at combining that theory with practice to make young leaders. And, you know, it never leaves you. And I note the row of people in familiar uniforms uh, up there. And it will never leave you when you get to my age. The development of leadership in the military is so effective that it stays with you forever. So it, it is a real privilege to hear the commanding officer of the best center in the world at creating leadership to be with us tonight. So once again, thank you for coming. I personally look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Good, uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, a very good evening to you. And um, it is uh, a genuine and signal honor for me to be here uh, this evening. And uh, I know that um, uh, Leeds OTC, many uh, of whose members are in the audience have worked hard to form a relationship with Leeds Beckett University, which is absolutely essential for reasons that I'll uh, mention in a moment. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here. And I would really encourage those of you who aren't in the OTC to grab them afterwards, uh, not literally, uh, but just have a quick chat to them. And, and you know, understand what the OTC is about, because uh, at its very heart, the OTC is also about developing leaders uh, and leadership. Um, now, as... Um, uh, Simon and Peter said, uh, I'm no longer the Commandant of Santos, I've moved on to uh, Pastors New, you know, uh, you can only have so much fun for so long, and certainly that's, uh, that's what the army tends to suggest. Um, and there are many, many fond memories uh, of my time as Commandant, and um, I was reminded actually when we were sort of walking uh, from the train station to here that um, <clears throat> I was witness to probably one of the most spectacular entrances that I've ever seen when I went across to uh, West Point, the United States Military Academy, uh, earlier on this year. And um, we run every year at, uh, at West Point a competition which is called, uh, interestingly enough, the Sandhurst Cup. Uh, one of my very far-sighted predecessors back in the 1960s uh, visited West Point, I think for the first time that a serving uh, commandant had visited uh, uh, West Point since the Second World War. And he presented the then commandant, or the superintendent as he's called, um, a sword and said, you know, Superintendent, here's a sword, a uh, token of our esteem, appreciation, of a grand alliance, and so on and so forth. You may wish to use it as a, uh, you know, for a suitable competition to give us a prize. And that gave birth to this thing called the Santa's Cup, which, uh, uh, and I won't bore you with the, uh, how West Point is, um, is organised, but they're divided into companies, and they have about uh, 20 of these companies in each uh, year's intake, and they use this competition to compete against each other for military, military skills competition. They give the sword out, as the Sandhurst Cup for, um, uh, for the prize. Which if you think about it, you know, the only world superpower, uh, their main principal military academy, which if you think Sandhurst is a venerable institution in the UK, West Point is more so in the United States. It's a great uh, way in which to ensure that, you know, Sandhurst and the brand remain visible in the United States. Anyway, we were there um, uh, this past April, and um, uh, at the end of the sort of 24 hours or so of competition, uh, they run a, a prize giving ceremony, and in classic American uh, tradition, it's immaculately well organized. The previous year, they've done it in this enormous auditorium called the Eisenhower Center, which is where when Obama gives his uh, big uh, speeches on defense, and he's filmed, it's normally where he does it. It seats about uh, 5,000 plus. Uh, and anyway, this time we thought that's too impersonal because there weren't 5,000 of us there. Uh, we would do it outside of the main edifice of West Point, which is called the Washington Building. 
And for those of you who haven't been there, and it's, it is worth a visit, and you can get in and just visit, it's on a bend in the Hudson, a very strategic location where George Washington uh, defended against the British Canadian force in uh, the, 17, uh, the late 1770s, early 1780s. And there's a sort of huge chain that they pulled across the, uh, uh, the Hudson there at the, where, where the choke point was to stop the British shipping coming down. Anyway, I digress. The edifice is um, about five stories high. It's high, sorry. It's granite and it's very forbidding and it's crenellated as well. Anyway, uh, the ceremony was going on and there were about 2,000 plus US and international cadets and uh, probably should have said there's this competition involves cadets from 40 different nations, all gathered out having barbecues and pizzas and sort of being on the lawn and waiting for you know, the ceremony to start. Uh, they had on the front steps a big sound system set up and, um, uh, and it was just getting dark. And then as it got dark, two spotlights came on and shone at the top, either side of the main edifice, uh, the top crenellations. And the superintendent of uh, West Point, Bob Caslam, and his uh, military commandant, uh, J.C. Thompson, abseiled down the outside of the building, five stories, jumping down, unhooked themselves, got off, and all the while there was pumping techno music, blasting out of these speakers, and the cadets were just going bananas, jumping up and down, sort of giving it that. And it was quite something. And anyway, me and all of us sort of Sandhurst cadets sort of you know, stood there like this and sort of two British fashion said, which was jolly interesting. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was, and I said to Bob Cazan afterwards, I said, well, thanks for that, mate. You know, I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm going to follow that. Although I did think of the commission, last commission parade I did of doing the same, absolutely outside the, uh, down the front of Old College, but I don't think that would have gone down too well. Um, so I'm really sorry that I just walked in the door this evening. And um, when I next come here, I'll try and do something a bit more spectacular. Uh, but there it is, it is a, um, a microcosm of, of leadership. Um, now, when I spoke to uh, Professor Robinson, he gave me some very specific advice. Speak for 40 minutes, make sure that there's some academic rigour in what you say, and be funny. <laughs> and by the way, we'll be filming you. Um, I ought to point out that in the current environment of ministerial scrutiny, uh, those two latter requests might be uh, mutually exclusive, but we'll see how it goes. And I ought also to point out that some of my very best work has ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, or I suppose I should say with Generation Z in the recycling bin. Um, now, I was asked also to provide an abstract for this speech, which hopefully uh, you will have seen uh, some sort of three weeks ago. And, and when Simon asked me three weeks ago, I think it was on the assumption that I actually started writing this. <laughs> Um, and um, rather than sort of writing it on board a HMS Ocean on the Western Mediterranean, which is where I was over the weekend, um, that in my defence, and I'll touch on this a moment, uh, when Simon rang, I was halfway through my latest assignment for the Major Project Leadership Academy, uh, of which uh, more in a moment. Uh, but for those of you who fear that I might be cuffing this, I can reassure you that what you're going to hear is, um, I suppose, a distillation of my thinking on leadership these past couple of years or so as uh, Commandant, which has really, I think, framed the preceding 25 years of my uh, military service. Um, and one of the interesting and various roles of the Commandant of Sandhurst is as what's called the Army's Director for Leadership, uh, which means that um, I was responsible for how leaders are developed in the Army. Not just officers, but our junior non-commissioned officers as well, corporals, sergeants, uh, warrant officers, and I have to say to a certain extent civil servants, interestingly enough, to a lesser extent, uh, and you may want to uh, pick that up in questions later on. So the structure of what I'm going to say is I'll start off by um, framing what I see as the issue in its broadest sense. What is this thing military leadership all about? I'll then sort of give a short narrative for how the army has got to where it is now uh, and how it's developed leaders uh, since the era of total war. Then I'll touch on uh, how leaders are developed at Sandhurst, uh, and I'll conclude with a few thoughts as the challenges that we're facing uh, in the years ahead. And I uh, suppose my premise for all of this is that leadership can't be taught. It can really only be learned. Uh, and there is a very subtle definition and difference between that, which I hope you pick up on uh, as I go through. Now, by way of um, illustration of that, I'll start with a quick example. It involves uh, an exercise that we run at Sandhurst, uh, which is called Exercise Normandy Scholar. Um, and the great thing about this exercise is that it um, takes a real uh, event which happened during the Second World War. It allows our Oscar cadets to think about the tactics 
um, about the realities of war, but principally about leadership. Uh, and the particular operation uh, that we look at is the D-Day Land, um, uh, 6th of June uh, 1944. Um, and the first time I uh, visited this uh, little exercise was about two years ago. In fact, it was about precisely this time, uh, two years ago, in November in Normandy, which, as you can imagine, uh, was pretty chilly uh, and bleak. But even so, the event in, uh, it, or the incident in question was the assault on Merville Battery. And for those of you who have been to the Normandy battlefield, it is probably one of the most impressive feats of arms of that campaign, certainly as far as the British Army was concerned. And it uh, took part in uh, to the west of, uh, sorry, to the east of uh, Caen, uh, and was an operation conducted by the 9th Battalion of the Parachute Regiment. And the 9th Battalion of the Parachute Regiment was commanded by a man called Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway, um, who was a very impressive uh, and well-decorated leader uh, before the Second World War, during it, and a uh, highly respected um, officer and member, uh, member of his community afterwards. Um, and his mission on the night of the 5th and 6th of uh, June in 1944 was to conduct an airborne assault uh, in the vicinity of the Merville Battery, which was a battery of reinforced concrete gun emplacements, which were ranged on uh, Sword Beach, which was a beach which was vital for the British landings. And that battery had to be neutralised in the parlance, i.e. destroyed, uh, and the guns uh, 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 defeated prior to the landings happened, otherwise the landings would probably be a complete catastrophe. Um, and in so doing, he had to conduct this airborne operation with 750 of his soldiers. There was going to be an additional coup de main, as it was called, a glider-borne operation, which was going to go down pretty much on top of the battery, just before H hour, partly as, as a diversion, but partly uh, to reinforce the final attack. And it was also dependent on the possession of a radio, which in those things were uh, rare indeed. And this radio was important because 10 miles off the coast of uh, the beach, there was HMS Arethusa steaming up and down. And its mission was to open fire on Merville Battery if uh, Otway wasn't able to communicate and tell the ship that the battery had been destroyed and the landings could go ahead. Anyway, on the night in question, for those of you who know anything about the campaign, uh, the parachute drop was uh, a near catastrophe. Um, of the 750 soldiers in Otway's battalion who were supposed to arrive at the RV, only 120 made it. The rest were either killed, they were either drowned uh, because the Germans had, in, had flooded the uh, surrounding fields, or they were captured, or they were lost. And of the 14 heavy machine guns which he was expecting to help him capture the battery, he had only one. He had none of the mortars, and, oh, and another thing, the radio had gone missing as well. So things were desperate. And uh, when we arrived at the location uh, where the uh, bomb took place, we actually, you actually stand on, the, uh, on the, the RV point and near the ditch where Otway and his very small tactical headquarters was taking cover. Um, and you can imagine what was going through the man's mind at the time. He had rehearsed this for months uh, at a place actually not far from Sanders, actually in Buckinghamshire on a hill there. He had run through the drill countless times, including uh, conducting uh, live drops and so on and so forth, and this was the one thing <coughs> he hadn't trained for. But they knew the plan, and he knew he had to conduct uh, the attack and take out the guns uh, before the landings happened. And so, um, what we do with the cadets is say, right, you know, they were all, by the t before they'd gone to France, brief the plan um, as, you know, they were, as if they were uh, uh, Colonel, Colonel Otway. Uh, and then we tell them what happened during the night, and we say, right, go away and think about what you would do to change the plan. And off they go in their little groups, uh, and they get together, and they have a little chat, and they come back, and we discuss what they do. How would you do a job which uh, had been planned for 750 uh, soldiers with only 120? Um, and we sort of talk about some of the options and so forth. We also use it as an opportunity to talk through some of the more interesting aspects of warfare. And so, uh, on the night in question, uh, and this actually happened, when Upway was doing his panic planning, um, six French civilians came wandering up the road. And this, bearing in mind, uh, was between two and three o'clock in the morning uh, of the 6th of June. Uh, there was all hell breaking loose, corn was on fire, uh, and you can see it glowing uh, in the uh, near horizon. Uh, there was artillery going off, 
uh, there are air raids going on and so forth. So what on earth were six French civilians doing wandering up the road? Otway, uh, the, the adjutant rather of the battalion, uh, grabbed the civilians, brought them to Otway and said, I've captured six French civilians, what shall I do with them? And he said, take them over there and shoot them. So we then say to the cadets, right, um, what would you do? You're the adjutant, what would you do? And anyway, um, they go away for a couple of minutes and came back and talked about it in their little groups. And um, I know that what I heard wasn't because I was there, because of what you're about to hear. But anyway, a uh, young man was sort of asked to sort of speak to his, uh, for, for his little syndicate of six. And the academic who facilitates the discussion said, um, uh, right, Mr. So-and-so, um, and I won't tell you who his name or which regiment he ended up in, um, <laughs> what would you do? And he said, well, you know, our group was split. Half of us said that we'd shoot them. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> um, and the other half said, uh, that'd be too noisy, we're baying at them. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there's a couple of interesting learning points from that. Um, I think the, the first, as far as the event is con itself is concerned, is the realities of leadership under severe pressure make people do things and say things which are generally out of character. And we'll sort of touch on that in a moment. Um, but interestingly enough, actually, one of my academics, Lloyd Clark, uh, who's written extensively about armoured warfare, both in uh, northern France and um, uh, North Africa, uh, he interviewed um, Terence Otway before, uh, before he died, about 10 years ago, and he asked him about that particular in incident. And uh, Terence Otway sort of said in a sort of rather Delphic uh, terms, he said, well, you know, when people come and ask you damn full questions, in the middle of a fight, then they're going to get damn full answers. Uh, and clearly, you know, his point as well is that he didn't actually mean that. But the point is, of course, that in a hierarchical structure, what did the adjutant, who was two ranks below him, think? What was he to conclude? And that's, of course, the point for the officer cadets. Now, why was it, therefore, that the officer cadets, who had been talked at and have reinforced over the course of six months, why did that young man think it would be okay not just to break the law of armed conflicts and Geneva Convention? and murder somebody in cold blood, innocent people in cold blood, but to do it in the most unpleasant way. Well, of course, because he is inexperienced, he's young, and he has not yet had the benefits of maturing and developing as a leader. Now, I said earlier on that I've been doing this thing called the uh, MPLA, and uh, it's, it's run by uh, the Major Projects Authority, which is part of the Cabinet Office, and the idea uh, of it uh, is to improve the way in which um, major projects are delivered to give major project leaders better leadership skills. And it wasn't until recently until he became head of the uh, civil service run by a chap called John Manzoni. And John Manzoni's a very interesting man. Came from uh, BP, where he was the chief operations officer uh, during the, um, uh, the, the, the problems they had in the, um, uh, in the Gulf. And tells a very interesting story about you know, his role in uh, leading the organization through and out the other side of this uh, disastrous uh, event. And he said, uh, at our sort of forming up event, um, he said, uh, this course is about leadership. The thing you've got to understand is that leadership is all about experience. And I, I reflected on that because, you know, what is it we do at Santos? What is that story, that little story I just told you about? It's about the effect that inexperience can have on people who are in leadership positions. And so this is not a straightforward business. This is an extremely difficult business uh, and one which... Um, you know, uh, I think still needs quite a bit of uh, thought and work. And my contention is not that um, leadership is not about experience. Indeed, it gets a damn sight easier with experience. But it is absolutely about more than that. Now, um, one of the uh, more favoured sons of Sandhurst is Bill Slim. Uh, he was actually, an, interesting enough, an alumni of... Um, uh, of Birmingham OTC. He uh, really joined the army uh, as a soldier, joined the Warwicks. Uh, and um, he's famous. This quote is much trotted out at Sandhurst. Leadership is just plain you. So, you know, he seems to be saying that it's about you and your personality. You being able to reflect your personality uh, on people, other people, and uh, convince them to do what you want to do. Well, yes, to a point. And I suppose it was easier for him to say that. Uh, and he said that actually when he was the sovereign's representative at uh, Sandhurst in uh, the early 1950s when he was the Chief of the G Imperial General Staff. Um, and he said that after 40 years plus of experience when he had commanded soldiers at every rank from, their uh, from second lieutenant all the way through to four-star general in two world wars. 
Uh, and of course, what those dots between uh, leadership and is uh, omit are the four lines that go in between that, where he talks about you know, the importance of uh, your values, uh, your uh, ability to display courage, both uh, personally and, uh, and professionally, uh, and also about experience. But he's absolutely right. It is largely about you. Now, Montgomery, for my money, and let's not uh, forget Montgomery came to the softer aspects of leadership uh, late on in life, uh, described it as the capacity and the, uh, and the will to rally men and women to a common purpose. So, common purpose, character, and inspiring confidence. And I think we're getting closer to what it is. Um, my personal favourite uh, quote is uh, this one from Eisenhower. And he brings out this business of ins inspiration and influence in order to give people ownership. Uh, one would call it today, I suppose, empowerment of uh, the outcome and the problem. And I put there at the bottom um, the Sandhurst Collect, the prayer for Sandhurst, which was devised when the academy was formed uh, from the combining of the Royal Military, original Royal Military Academy in um, Woolwich and the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. Um, and the collect is obviously uh, the prayer uh, for Sandhurst. Um, and you will note from that uh, the notion of mastery, the ability to master yourselves, uh, you know, the sort of the damn pink notions of motivation and so on and so forth, uh, uh, the notion of self discipline, and the idea of supporting, subordinating yourself to a higher purpose. And that is obviously implicit within the Sandhurst motto of serve to lead, which clearly has Judeo-Christian roots uh, and would have been familiar to all of the, and they were called this, gentlemen cadets in 1947. And the fact that that collect is inscribed above the east door of the Royal Military Chapel at Sandhurst suggests that there is something spiritual about the way in which the British Army has viewed and still does view leadership. And um, John Adair, who more in a moment, uh, uses this quote, and uh, so do I, most of the lectures I use, to really look at that spiritual aspect of uh, leadership. Um, and when he was speaking about uh, the Earl of Montrose in uh, 1930, uh, he talked about um, the business of unlocking greatness in others being the art of leadership, putting greatness in humanity, but to elicit it, for the greatness is already there. Aspirational, yes but actually gets at the heart of where we are in Sandhurst. Now, the reason I use historic examples is, in many respects, because the military has been at the forefront of uh, military thinking, particularly the application of leadership uh, for the last uh, many decades. Uh, perhaps we've been remiss in not writing enough of it down, uh, although some has been, not necessarily in a pedagogic academic sense, but uh, it has been written down nonetheless. Now, the earliest known uh, army leadership publication is called Serve to Lead, uh, which was first published around about 1947, and is still considered to be, to, to many, particularly my previous generations, as to be the greatest thing ever written about leadership. Uh, it is certainly a publication of its time. Um, and um, if I just sort of uh, give you a flavour, this is um, a sort of later copy of the first edition. And the, pre the preface here, there's a... Um, uh, a piece from the Lord Bishop of Durham, uh, uh, given in the Walker Trust Lecture on Leadership in 1934. Again, it's in Andrews, interesting enough. And he says, It is the fact that some men possess an inbred superiority which gives them a dominating influence over their contemporaries and marks them out unmistakably for leadership. This phenomenon is as certain as it is mysterious. It is apparent in every association of human beings, in every variety of circumstances, and on every plane of, uh, of culture. In a school amongst the boys, in a college amongst the students, in a factory, shipyard, or mine amongst the workmen, as certainly as in the church and the nation. There are those who, with an assured and unquestioned title, take the leading place and shape the general conduct. Yes, as I say, it is of its time. Um, and let us not forget that it was written after a period of uh, this, this publication, after a period of total war. Um, and the original authors uh, deliberately selected um, quotes from uh, famous people, mostly, uh, who would elicit the ideas of courage uh, and discipline, and those qualities which 
uh, its authors, and certainly those who were teaching at Sanders at the time, saw as being essential to be conducting any future war. And let us not forget either that at that particular time, late 1940s, early 1950s, we were potentially on the cusp of a Third World War. It's been updated many times since. Uh, it now contains uh, more modern contributions, uh, including from women uh, and many from non-military authors as well. Uh, and interesting enough, we still issue it to uh, cadets when they come uh, to Sandhurst. Um, to complement that, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the Commandant of the Day uh, produced uh, the blue publication there called uh, the Queen's Commission a Junior Officer's Guide. And it was, uh, as the title suggests, a guide to young officers who had got through Sandhurst, where they had had an initial education uh, and learnt as much as they could about leadership, but were probably still inexperienced in terms of uh, you know, how it would be applied uh, in an operational setting. Uh, and it introduced the notion of officership, which is an interesting word. Officership being a term which um, has its sort of roots back in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries and uh, describes the additional responsibilities that an individual would have from holding a public office, if you like, in a sort of financial sense, a sort of fiduciary type of uh, responsibility. Now, these two publications coincided with our attempts in the 1990s to codify our ethos more precisely. Um, uh, in the face of what we then perceived to be policies that might erode that most intangible component of fighting power, the moral component. So, for example, the BET report of 1995 recommended the tri-service centralisation of all of our personnel functions, our HR functions, if you like, which meant that we would have to subordinate, subordinate ourselves to the way in which the Navy and the, R and the RAF uh, did their business. Uh, there was new employment legislation, we lost crown immunity, uh, and there were concepts such as duty of care and health and safety, which were entering the government lexicon, if not necessarily ours at that particular time. And all of this combined seems to suggest that it was eroding um, uh, our, and diminishing our claims of unlimited, unlimited liability uh, on military service. And we increasingly found that we had to make the case that the Army's unique task, in essence, to kill or be killed on the battlefield, required a special ethical basis drawn from traditional morality. In the political and ethical climate of the 1990s, the argument didn't uh, prove to be particularly sustainable. Um, and it was recognised that under law and the constitution, such as it is in this country, the army actually had very little right to demand to be different from society. Um, because it was, after all, from society that we drew its members to protect it. So as a consequence of all of that, uh, and to ensure that our soldiers had a fighting chance of understanding what was expected of them, coming from a, a society which had different values from those which uh, potentially that uh, they were uh, joining. We codified this within a military covenant, uh, which was published in our values and standards on the right hand side there. And our values and standards of courage, discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty and selfless commitment. Uh, which were devised back then to describe our ethos, have really stood the test of time. And any academic and ethical analysis would, I suppose, um, show them to be a compromise between several ethical positions, um, principally a compromise between uh, utilitarian and um, theological ethics, uh, particularly uh, Judeo-Christian. Um, but it was a reflection, nonetheless, uh, that society had moved on, uh, and uh, we had to go with the times. So why this diversion into um, ethics and virtues? Well, quite simply, because over the years, uh, we have recognised um, uh, that we need to articulate a bit more clearly what leadership in the army is all about. It is values-based. It's not values-based leadership, of which more in a moment, but it is absolutely <coughs> based on values, and that is how we have always and continue to develop leaders. Now, one of um, Sandhurst's most influential figures uh, was Professor John Adair, and he developed the notion of action-centered leadership based on his experience of Sandhurst, where he taught during the 1960s uh, as a lecturer in the War Studies Department, interestingly enough. Um, and he was really wrestling with this question of, are leaders born or are they made? And you know, the good Bishop of Durham would suggest that they're absolutely born, it's in our <laughs> DNA go to a, you know, a decent school and come from a decent family, then you've got a fighting chance, you know, otherwise not so much. Um, now, you know, what John Adair was able to demonstrate 
was that you could develop leadership through the practical application of leadership opportunities based on developing specific skill sets within young people, principally uh, young people. Um, and back then, and it has to be said against prevailing and indeed uh, a good proportion of non-academic thinking, John suggested uh, that this indeed was possible. Now, at that point, I suppose Sandhurst was teaching, uh, although they didn't call it that at this time, what would be called now as great man or trait theory. You know, show these various qualities, you know, like Alexander, like Churchill, and you'll be a good leader and try to admit it. And in fact, at the time, right up until the uh, mid-1960s, we used to teach uh, Slim's five virtues, you know, courage, discipline, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and we had just, I suppose, moved into the era of situational leadership or skills theory. And that's really what John was, the point that John was trying to make, that some leaders thrive in some situations and don't in others. Churchill, for example, a classic case in point. Brilliant wartime prime minister, recognised as not a particularly successful peacetime prime minister, although I have to say he was quite old when he, uh, when he took that last uh, 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 job on. Um, and obviously, the third sort of major area of sort of leadership theory, group dynamics or, or group theory, was again part of what John was trying to get at. The notion of how you lead a team, how you lead through teams, and how you can delegate two teams to lead. Um, and that also was deeply unfashionable at the time. Now, you know, I'm not sort of, uh, uh, I know that the um, uh, august academic uh, uh, horsepower in front of me doesn't need um, uh, telling this, but, uh, you know, the uh, trait, situational and uh, group theories were combined in uh, the US framework of the Be No Do framework. And interestingly enough, the Be No Do framework lies at the heart of our other publication, uh, Developing Leaders. And I think the Be No Do framework has very much stood uh, the test of time. Um, but anyway, back to action centred leadership, because this is really where I started when I was at, University, at, uh, at Sandhurst. Uh, and it's where many of my predecessors uh, started. And um, we uh, um, sort of got to know John uh, again uh, over the last couple of years when we started looking at the whole business of how the British Army uh, needs to do leadership in the future. And what was interesting sort of talking to him is, you know, how that journey that I've just described in that narrative, you know, actually played out. And I think, you know, he would be the first to say that, you know, he felt he had to move on because he'd done as much as he could do at Sandhurst. Um, and yet when he came back to Sanders on visits, he you know, saw the Venn diagram, which uh, he devised, being taught in all sorts of different sorts of ways, with uh, you know, circles not connected at all, or not overlapping properly, or barely overlapping at all. And so you know, he's been at, um, at pains to try and bring some orthodoxy to the way in which uh, this is viewed. And of course the theory here is that um, actually when you're leading in a particular situation, you may well not always be hitting the sweet spot in the middle. You may well, according to, you know, if the circumstances demand it, if the task is important enough, you have to put individual considerations and needs to one side. And therefore, you're going to be in the overlapping bit of the team and the task. But its point, of course, is that that's not sustainable in the long term. At some point, you have to try to centre your leadership and the leadership of the organisation back into the middle at some stage. Um, and I think this still has stood the test of time. Uh, and it's something, uh, a model that we still use um, at Sandhurst. And in discussions with him, what he took for granted at the time and became lost in <coughs> through the mist of time was the fact that all of that is absolutely and fundamentally based on a shared set of values and standards, uh, of which more in a moment. Now, this sets the bar pretty high as far as the young people come to Sanders. It's not unachievable, and um, you know, for goodness sake, I made it through, so it's not going to be, you know, it can't be that difficult. Um, but it is all about selecting the right people, and we have an advantage at Sanders because we run everybody who comes through our gates has passed a selection where they have demonstrated that they have got the potential to be a leader, and the Army Officer Selection Board at Westbury in the west of Wiltshire. Uh, is where that happens. And uh, prospective candidates spend uh, three to four days there um, running through a series of tests and assessments. And if you speak to anybody who has been through AOSB, and some from the OTC may well have, and will, uh, I'm sure be delighted to share their experiences as that, uh, it is probably the most testing period in that individual's life up to that point. And my goodness me, 
people really get to know themselves, a downside better, over that brief period at the end of it, uh, cons compared to where they began. The point, I suppose, of this slide, and this is the framework against which we assess people, <coughs> is that the vast majority of areas that we are looking at are in the personality and intellectual spaces. We are less concerned about physical ability. Yes, there's a, uh, a minimum standard, but you know, if you've got a minimum standard, we've got a year at Sandhurst or, uh, or, or longer, or you know, depending on which course you do, to develop that. And frankly, over a course of a military career, you can get fit as a fiddle. Yes, practical ability and practical application is important to an extent, but again, that's what we spend most of our time at Sandhurst doing, so we're less interested in that. What we are interested in is what makes you, you. What is your personality, and have you got the brain power to be able to understand a problem, analyse it, and produce a solution? Now, in doing that assessment, we apply about as much science, I think, as it's possible to do. We still use Myers-Briggs, interestingly enough, uh, and that does all right for us. Uh, we are, at the time of writing, I think, uh, looking at uh, other uh, perspective uh, uh, or candidate um, uh, personality assessment. But again, Myers-Briggs does okay for us. Uh, but principally, it is about uh, making, uh, you know, putting a person in situations outside of their comfort zone and assessing what their reaction is. We don't necessarily care whether they succeed in a task or fail in a task. It's how they go about it, how they interact with team members, and how they take success and failure. Um, and it won't surprise you to hear that uh, what happens at Sandhurst is that we identify the positive qualities which um, we are looking for uh, and which come out during this uh, particular assessment board um, and do that by turning people from civilians first into soldiers and then into officers, i.e. leaders. And the path of that is not always straightforward. Um, <coughs> a little while ago, I, um, and again, you know, I, I said before I tell this little story that this is not Leeds OTC, I used to get invited as commandant to a number of um, OTC uh, dinners, which was great, great fun. Uh, and I went to one particular dinner where I was required to do a bit of speaking afterwards, and so got to the end of dinner and I was just sort of flicking through my, uh, my notes uh, under the table. And I looked up, just happened to look across the room, and there um, at the dining table was a group of um, OTC cadets, students, um, who were enjoying themselves, and it was a great evening, and we were all very smart, in a black tie, and I was in Mexico and so forth. And I saw this um, young bloke, uh, sort of, uh, you know, and he was looking a bit, sort of, you know, he's wobbling a bit, you know, it had been sort of a long evening, and I'm sure he had um, uh, partaken freely of the, uh, the free wine available. And he got, got, took, excuse me, took out a, a straw, and he stuck the straw in a glass of that, that much sort of red wine in it, he stuck it in there, and, um, you know, no word of a lie here. Some of you may be familiar with this. Stuck it up his nose and snorted this up his nose. And I thought, you know, <laughs> that's, that's extraordinary. I've never seen that before. I turned to the uh, uh, young sort of student next to me. I said, did you see that? And I explained to her. She said, oh, yes. Well, that's because uh, the, wine's here is, the wine here is quite expensive. And so it's a quick way of getting drunk. Um, <laughs> to which my response was, you know, not quite who knew. But um, it, was, uh, it was interesting. Now, clearly, you know, I was a student once. And, you know, I probably saw a number of things far worse than that in my time uh, as a student. Um, the point, of course, is that um, uh, you know, that young man misunderstood why it was uh, we serve alcohol and drink alcohol in the military. It is not to get drunk. It is because it is a way in which to have a convivial and interesting time. It's a way of bonding. Uh, and, you know, there have been, uh, I think, some unhelpful narratives um, in the past, you know, uh, associating the, uh, the military with uh, heavy drinking. I'm glad to say that things have changed a lot over uh, my career, and um, uh, it is um, um, far rarer uh, now than, uh, than it used to be. The point, of course, of this is that the values of that uh, young man, and I could have you know, chosen anybody in that room, I dare say, who hadn't been through Sandhurst, and the values we expect of a leader in the army are very, very different. And this little um, uh, matrix here was knocked together by a friend of mine who is a, um, a padre in the army. He also happens to have a PhD in, um, in applied ethics. And he looked at our values and standards, which are down the middle there in green, and thought, you know, what would be useful is to give our leaders, particularly our junior leaders, some reference points. You know, a bit of a left and a right of arc, as we would call it, of, you know, what is unacceptable behaviour and what's acceptable behaviour and clearly you know in that good Christian sense the, uh, the, uh, the aim is to try and start, stay on the true path and so forth um, but you can go over one side and you know too much 
And if you're going to go into the amber, then you need to sort of, you know, take a few, uh, a few checks and get people back on track as, as soon as you can. If you go into the red, then action needs to be taken immediately. And I thought that that's, um, you know, quite a useful little way of uh, looking at it. And it has no, it, it's uh, Philip Reform Act's not mine. Uh, it has no standing in doctrine, but it's being discussed at the moment by the army as to whether or not that's something, a useful framework to use, lead, uh, to use for leaders. And it's certainly something that we uh, expose our cadets to at Sandhurst, and they absolutely find it interesting because that process of adjustment is pretty difficult. So how do we do it? Um, three ways. Firstly, understand yourself. It is the first requirement of a leader to understand themselves. Uh, and that's not just me saying that. That's probably just about anybody who's written anything on uh, the art of leadership ever. We have a um, great system at Sandhurst of peer review. So at the end of a particular exercise or training evolution, uh, we will, each member of an individual's, <coughs> individual's platoon, and there's about uh, 25 to 30 people in each platoon, will be asked to rate people in their platoon, to score them, to say, are they good or bad? And then, you know, it's all done anonym anon anonymously, uh, the platoon commander will then tell the individual where their peers see them in their platoons and read out some of the comments. Uh, so it's a, you know, a very <coughs> rough and ready but very effective form of peer review. Not quite 360 reporting, but you know, not far off. And of course, the cadets being the cadets uh, refer to it as Slater Mate. Um, <laughs> the second area is understanding others. Um, and of course, if a leader is to be credible within a team, he or she has got to understand their people, absolutely understand them. Not just where they've come from, what qualifications they've got and so on and so forth, but principally, and probably most importantly, what makes them tick. How to tap into their motivation and go with the grain in order to get them to do something. It goes back to this business that Montgomery and Eisenhower were talking about. How do you get in them to empower themselves to want to do uh, what's got to be done? And the third area, understanding their environment and that means culture it means difference um, and it means context and that's essential to understanding any mission or task analyzing it and forming a plan um, so that's the sort of in broad outlines how to do it and that is not alchemy um, there's a number of sort of contextual issues which are just as important the grounds of Sandhurst for any of you who have been there it does look like an 18th century stately home because it was designed to be an 18th century home. Nobody lived in it, but the architects at the time, in the late 18th, uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries, um, liked to create an environment which would affect behaviours. And so if, as happened at that time, the credence was that um, the officer class was drawn from the landed gentry, you created an atmosphere where they were schooled, which made them feel that they were part of the landed gentry. And the reason why Sandhurst was built, interestingly enough, is because of the British Army's disastrous performance in the Flanders campaign during uh, uh, 1796 to 1797, and the fact that we had therefore lost most of our officer class. Most of the officers were either too old or too young, and we had to replace them. And so, as the British often did, they went to the mercantile classes, the middle classes and so forth, i.e. people who hadn't quite gone to the smart schools and come from the smart families that uh, others did. But it was revolutionary at the time. So those grounds do have an effect still today on the young people who go there. The second contextual issue is the staff. We choose the best instructors, no question. And the reason we know, I know we choose the best instructors is because we go out looking for them. To be a senior non-commissioned officer, a colour sergeant or a sergeant major, you have to have passed a course, a pretty tough and rigorous selection course. And we select people, not on physical prowess, not necessarily on intellect, but that's important, but on their character. Are they, over a two-year posting, where they are going to be under pressure themselves virtually every single day and under scrutiny themselves virtually every single day, going to react in the right way? And going to, you know, when Mr. So-and-so, you know, makes the same mistake for the 15th time, you've got a guarantee that that colour sergeant, that captain, is not going to lose their rag and do something unfortunately. So that's important in, choose, in terms of choosing staff. And of course, they are role models. And the final contextual issue is that we create controlled pressure. Lack of sleep, lack of food, uh, time pressure, lack of familiar, uh, familiar surroundings, and the normal exposure to fear, <coughs> dark, water, height, so on and so forth. 
Most significantly, uh, this is not a process that stops when the officer cadet marches up the steps of Old College. Um, and as officers themselves, they will become role models. So it's essential that they continue to develop themselves as leaders uh, once they leave. And it's this aspect of leadership, our continual professional development, that we've been looking at most closely uh, recently for a number of reasons. First, because the nature of our business uh, has not changed, but the character has. Um, our trade in the most extreme circumstances will be uh, in lives taken and lives saved. Uh, but in future, we are likely to face threats uh, from multiple actors, state and non-state, who may not or may be connected. Our enemies are likely to employ a full spectrum of effects and technologies against us, crude all the way through to highly sophisticated, and we are always going to be operating amongst <coughs> densely, uh, po the population potentially in dense urban environments. And to answer the challenge of this new paradigm, we've got to deliver, deliver, uh, develop leaders who can not just survive in chaos and ambiguity, but can thrive and improve in it. And they are special people indeed. Secondly, in the post-Afghan era, the purpose of the British Army is wider than ever it was before. It means rescuing Mrs Jones when her house is flooded, uh, putting out the fire in a house when the firemen are on strike, as well as deploying to abroad <coughs> to deal with those issues uh, that she sees on the news and thinks we must do something about, whether it be migrants trying to cross uh, the Mediterranean Sea or um, disease in West Africa. The issue for us as leaders is playing a part in a response where we are not necessarily in charge, where it may be another government department was in charge, and it may not even be a government department at all. And that requires a very different approach to leadership. Thirdly, and as ever thus, society is changing. It always has. And we have got to retain a uh, determined effort to uh, maintain society's respect. The generation we seek to recruit has values, attitudes and beliefs uh, that are different and evolving rapidly through social media. You'll probably be uh, able to better inform me uh, than I. Um, but the other side of this um, is that... Um, uh, we've got to recruit people from that society. Uh, and uh, I, I, sense, I have sensed over the last five years or so that you know, things like um, the financial crisis and so on and so forth have slightly changed the paradigm. I detect that there is a thirst and a desire for more values-based leadership, for institutions which uh, are genuine and authentic uh, and which are morally sound and sustainable. And I you know, generally believe that there's a thirst for uh, a more moral and ethical approaches to the way in which uh, our society is run. And finally, um, whilst there's much good about army leadership, there have been cases of unacceptable behaviour. And the um, incident that you'll see on the slide behind me uh, was one such, a famous one. And what, of course, is interesting is that if you look in the broad context of the number of incidents that happened during the Iraq and the Afghan campaign, literally tens of thousands of incidents uh, where there was you know, action against an enemy, um, hardly any, a handful, where you know, things like this, camp breadbasket and so on and so forth, um, have had a disproportionate effect on our reputation. And we have got to get after this. Um, you will, may have seen recently the Chief of the General Staff um, produce the findings of a survey indicating that uh, in instances of bullying, harassment um, and discrimination in the British Army were at an unacceptably high level. I mean, not high, interestingly enough, lower than most uh, civilian counterparts, but still too high for an organisation such as ours. And we have seen the reputation of the United States and the Australian armies uh, seriously dented by uh, famous incidents of unacceptable behaviour, which required government intervention. And that's where we do not want to go. And as uh, General David Morrison, who Chief of the Australian Army, said in June 2003, after one such incident, uh, we must recognise it and own the solution. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So what are we doing about it? The answer is quite a lot, and indeed we've been doing so for some years. I left off the narrative in sort of the early 2000s uh, when we were getting to grips with uh, our changing status in society. And around about the same time, the Royal Marines were getting alongside um, uh, Professor Lou Hardy and some researchers from Bangor University. 
And together with the uh, Institute of Naval Research, they went down to the Royal Marine Training Centre at Lindston to understand why the wastage rate amongst uh, marine recruits is so high. And uh, they came up with some interesting deductions, the upshoot of which was that the instructors at Lindston were advised to go about training their recruits in a very different way, using some of the techniques which you would understand from transformation leadership, and you could probably pick up and read when you're reading, uh, reading uh, John Whitmore. Um, and those techniques um, led very directly to a demonstrable improvement in performance and a reduction in wastage rate. And those same techniques were introduced into the Army, the Army's Recruiting and Training Division, a few, a few years later uh, in the Infantry Training School uh, up at Catterick and had exactly the same impact, reducing wastage rates, improving performance. Um, and so in 2008, we created a thing called the Staff Leadership School at Purbright, where every instructor that goes into the Army Training Organisation receives that sort of training intervention and is taught how to teach using coaching and mentoring type methodologies. And this has been the approach uh, and the principal vehicle for developing the Army Leadership Code. Now, what is it? As I mentioned earlier, um, leadership is part of our professional development as soldiers. And the challenges um, I outlined uh, place an added emphasis on <coughs> ensuring that we remain role models for our subordinates and peers throughout our careers and continue to improve our understanding and application of leadership. Clearly, the same style and approach is not suited for every environment and at every level. And while John's action-centred leadership is highly appropriate for junior leaders, and indeed is a useful handrail for leaders at all levels, at the operational and organisational level and at the strategic level, other models are perhaps more helpful. I mentioned at the, uh, the start that I'm um, approaching the final stages of the MPLA, and during that particular uh, training intervention, we um, uh, get taught something called the primary colours model. It does, I have to say, look a lot like um, John's action-centred leadership model, but it looks at the environments of uh, um, uh, personal, uh, the personal area, are your own personal leadership, the team area, and, um, and strategy. Um, and it's very useful for leading major projects. Um, similarly, the Army and Defence more widely is now looking at how we need to uh, equip leaders at that strategic level with the right sort of skills to lead the army in a complex modern environment because certainly when you're not deployed in operations it is like running a very large international uh, corporation. But what we must never lose sight of is that although the nature of leadership in the army will never change, its character must. And to ensure therefore that we're rooted in our ethos and our values and standards, what we've done is distill aspects of transactional and transformational theory into this very uh, simple and uh, well-authored, I have to say, by one of my team, uh, code. And you will recognise a lot of the themes that I've spoken about during my piece here uh, re uh, reflected there. And I think the important point to make is that, um, and I made it, I was a piece to make it to all of my cadets and all of my staff, this doesn't represent a softening of our culture. As I say, we have still got to lead in the most demanding of circumstances. But this is about maximising the potential and the talent of all of our people. And at some stages, transformational techniques are not going to be appropriate. And you do just have to tell people to get the hell on with it. That's still very much the Army way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Sue. Um, in case you don't know me, many of you don't, uh, my name is Phil Cardew, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at the University and one of the joys of being DVC is you arrive at these things expecting to have a nice quiet evening and get told you've got to give the vote of thanks at the end, so thank you very much Professor Robinson for that. Um, I'm going to invite you all to, um, we've got about ten or, ten or so minutes for questions in a minute, but while you're thinking of those, I just thought I'd give a few reflections of my own, if I might, before we go. One thing, aspect of my life, apart from being used to spent teaching students Beowulf, a 3,113 line poem about the transition from bravery to wisdom, fortitudo et sapientia, as the, as the uh, uh, philosophers in the day said. 
And Beowulf is a character who ultimately fails in his leadership role as king because he is too good in his bravery role uh, as warrior. He does not have the wisdom to be able to collect the team around him. He's too good at what he does, and he has to go off in, the, in his last bout and fight the dragon on his own because he hasn't trained the people around him to take that role on for him. And it, that made a lot of what Stuart was saying made me think about that and think about the, the, that context still exists today. But of course, today you have the added interesting context of of the the, the, the social and the moral. Um, context of, of modern society to put on top of that the, the way that other people view you. It also very quickly made me think about the, the, the work we do within a university um, and I think you said right at the beginning of your, 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 your talk Steve, about learning and teaching or teaching and learning and I think um, we often hear particularly because many of our students arrive at the university without the social capital that many um, leaders under some of the, uh, the, the, the more arcane and, uh, the, uh, and old-fashioned views that expressed there would have. Um, we, have to, we have to move people through from a concept that they're being taught to a concept that they're learning, and that they will become independent learners and capable of engaging critically with the subjects they have rather than accepting them, and learning to stand on their own two feet and, and, and I think again a lot of what you were talking about in terms of officership I think you called it would be uh, a, an equally horrible term of graduateness um, within, a, within a university con context um, and I, it just you know, a, a lot of resonance there I think it, 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 within our own lives even if we're not training people to take on the immense challenges that, that, that Stuart has had um, over his career. So I'll stop witchering now. We've got, um, I said, five or ten minutes for any questions you might want to give. I think.